Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, if you're joining us on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen. Wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a Q&A button. Type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're joining us on YouTube, just feel free to use the live chat function wherever it happens to be on the device that you're using, and I'll get to those questions and comments at the end as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last nine years or so, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. So about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they service in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I worked in a dealership and over time, I guess, just became the default dyad guy in the shop. So I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic for today is going to be driver comfort systems operation and testing. So you might think, well, driver comfort systems. So the way I categorize this class is going to be things that are nice to have, but things that aren't necessary for the operation of the vehicle. But since they're electronic, mechanical, what have you, they may break. So we're going to talk about a few different things in here. And we may have a few surprises when I go live on the tool at the end as well. We're going to talk about heated and vented seats. Nice to have. I would love to have ventilated seats the summer we've had, but um, how does it work? How does it operate? You know, Because if it breaks, we're going to need to make sure it works correct. A uh, heated steering wheel, same type of deal. Noise canceling system. So there are now systems on vehicles that'll inside the cabin will cancel exterior noise uh, to keep the volume down inside the cabin. There's also sound generation systems. So it'll generate a sound going down the road. And uh, electronic motor mounts as well. So there's uh, active motor mounts on some vehicles now. And in order to diagnose a drivability problem, you may need to disable those somehow using a functional test with the scan tool to be able to go through there and uh, actually diagnose, well, is the engine running bad or not? I can't tell because the mounts are uh, decreasing the amount of vibration, right? So a uh, bunch of different things. And maybe, like I said, a couple more things as we go live on the tool. So heated seats first. These have been around for a while, right? They've, they've always been available aftermarket uh, and man, most manufacturers at some point they're standard nowadays. I'm sure there are, some of them are optional, but it's a pretty standard thing to have a car with heated seats now. So use an electric heater element inside the fabric. So it's like a version of, think about a toaster. It doesn't get quite as hot, of course, but it works on the same type of principle. It's a piece of wire, piece of metal, uh, with some resistance in it. And as we increase the current flow going through it, it will increase the amount of temperature that it heats up to. Uh, usually the seat and the back are separate. Sometimes they're tied together kind of in the middle because you need to be able to move that seat back, backwards and forwards uh, independently of the base. Uh, but sometimes they can have like a little cable in between that they're tied together. Usually if you're going to find a problem with a seat heater, it's going to be a short somewhere in there and you'll see like a little black spot where it burned out. Or uh, I know oftentimes on Subaru, they had this little like resistor in there and that would fail and you'd have a problem. Both the seat back and the bottom could fail or just the bottom fails or just the back fails. Customer may just complain, you know, the, my back gets hot, but my seat doesn't. Uh, so that could be a thing. And also now, Used to only be in the front seats. Now we can find them in the rear seats as well. In the vehicle. I was in a, what, what was that? What was I driving the other day? It was a, it's a Buick and it had three rows of heated seats in the back. So you know, it's just depending on how you equip the car, how you, how you option it out. Uh, it may very well, every single seat in the vehicle could have it. And what's another good way to diagnose a heated seat? Well, it's, of course, if you have a thermal imager, that makes it real easy. So if you look on the left-hand side, that is a bad one in the driver's seat. We can see how it's not, not really making much temperature. And then on the, uh, the passenger seat, we can see how we can see the uh, elements, the heater elements. And then over here is after it's repaired on the heated seat here, we can see the elements going by underneath the fabric. So you can see where the temperature would be. That'd be underneath the fabric in another fabric layer in there. So that's your wire element, your metal metallic element as it heats up as the current flows through it it increases the amount of heat so that'd be 
And, and for those, as far as electrical diagnosis, it's not usually a big deal. It's usually a relay and a switch. Uh, it's pretty standard uh, electrical diagnosis at that point. I, I was kind of hard pressed to find functional tests on a vehicle, to be able to turn those on and off. There's a couple of vehicles that have them. Um, but by and large, like I said, it's a switch and a relay and it turns on and that just allows a certain amount of current through the switch. Taking that heated seat to the next level though, we have ventilated seats. So those, there's really no good way of actually chilling a seat. So I couldn't really put refrigerant through because I need some, some high pressure kind of stiff, thick piping or what have you to put the refrigerant through that. I bet you if you could figure it out, you'd probably, probably make a small fortune if you could figure out how to do it and make it flexible and comfortable for a, for a person. Um, so in this case, they use fans. So you'll have a perforated, maybe leather or perforated fabric of some sort. And they'll have, looks like, it's like kind of a, a computer fan type uh, of system. You'll have a blower with some ducting and then it just blows it to the back of your back and then it maybe blows it on the seat as well. I've seen them both in a push configuration or a pull configuration. So either you'll get the air going out into your back and that's what cools you off or it pulls away from your back and it, it removes the moisture in that way uh, so it'll pull it off so I've, I've seen them working in both ways but really it's, it's diagnosing that fan right diagnosing that fan if it doesn't work uh, and there are sometimes control modules for that and sometimes it's relays and things of that nature so here's a seat and this has a couple different things there so it has a lower lumbar adjustment which uh, we don't we're not talking about today but it, it is in there we can see it it's electric it's got a little rope there uh, and then there's my fan and kind of my ducting that goes through. And then also we have the seat heater element. So in this particular seat, the fan can blow through the heater element to let warm air come through as well if needed, say, in the colder weather. And you can see there's a module in there as well. Uh, so a lot of different things uh, can be found inside a seat. We're gonna I'm going to talk about another thing that Mercedes has, which I thought was kind of crazy when I first saw it. When we go live on the tool, uh, we'll talk more about that with the seat too. Heated steering wheel, another thing, really nice to have. Once, once you drive a vehicle with it and you live in a cold climate like I do, man, you do not want to go back. But it uses a similar element, just like the heated seats, except it's underneath the leather. So you can see it's just kind of a, uh, a cutaway view here, and you can see the element going back and forth. And it warms it up pretty nicely. Now, if we could figure out a way to do cooled steering wheel, there's another idea for you, I, th I think. If you could figure out how to do a cooled steering wheel, I think you'd probably still use a fan, but I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Once again, if you wanted to find a uh, problem with a heated steering wheel, hey, it's not heating up or it's only heating up in certain spots, you can see the element by using thermal imaging again. So we can see here's my good one. We can see the brake. Uh, that's probably where the connector is, I would imagine, or the seam in the leather. And then we can see how the heat goes all the way around. That is a good steering wheel. And that is a steering wheel that's not getting any warmer than its surroundings there. We can see the heat's on, though, 92 degrees up there. But the steering wheel is at 112 degrees. So that's a pretty warm steering wheel. Pretty warm steering wheel. Uh, once again, usually switches, relays. Um, sometimes you might be able to find a functional test in there, uh, but usually it's just your standard electrical you know, 12 volts. Noise cancellation. So here's another one. This has actually been around for a while, maybe you know, five, six, 10 years or so. Uh, but what it does is it uses microphones in the cabin and it uses the audio system to play back a canceling frequency to what's coming in. So if I hear road noise, engine noise coming in, it'll play back, it basically just inverts the pattern and it cancels out uh, what's going through the speakers. And there's a it's kind of a, the, the graphic kind of makes sense here. So if I have some noise coming out, I'm gonna have a sine wave because all sound is sine waves. And when it comes out like this, we can see it going up and down and then the anti-noise, is going to go the other way. So it's, it's going to have a peak where there's a valley and a valley where there's a peak cancels each other out. And then that gives us the resulting noise is much less. It's, it doesn't really go away entirely, but it reduces it by a really great amount. So that's within the vehicle. It, it's going to play it back. And on some of the systems I looked at, I think the one we're going to look at a little bit later on the tool as well, uh, actually says that it, the audio system is always on with that. Now you might not be playing the radio, you might not be playing a CD or whatever, but it will uh, it will always stay on so it can do this with the noise cancellation system. So if I don't, 
If it's not working, then I'll hear a lot more road noise or it could be working periodically, something of that nature. So then it deals with the stereo system, speakers, microphones, and there are functional tests for those sorts of things. And then let's talk sound generation systems. So you're gonna find these more often on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles because they don't have really much of an engine noise going at a slow speed. So it plays an audio to alert pedestrians of a moving vehicle. So especially like blind folks are trying to cross the street. They don't know there's a car there, that could be a problem. So it's gonna play some sort of an audio type tone uh, to alert them of that. Commonly called acoustic vehicle alerting systems are just about, most manufacturers have their own little marketing term for it, but that's pretty much what it is. Started in Japan uh, with the Prius and it was mandated by Japan in 2010. In Europe, it was mandated in 2014. U.S. passed the law for it in 14, but it didn't have to come into force for five years. So it was enforced starting in 2019. So really, it's pretty much your 2020 model year and up. They kind of just established a worldwide standard. Everybody follows along the same rules. Has to come on below 18.6 miles an hour. Or that's 30 kilometers an hour for those who use the metric system. And the manufacturers, like I said, use various tones or sounds. And I actually have a recording of a Nissan LEAF. So that's a full electric vehicle here. It's from the LEAF owners group. I found this on YouTube here. Uh, so it's going to play two different tones. One is as the vehicle is approaching and then one as the vehicle is backing up, which kind of sounds like a normal backup beat, but it's a little bit different. So let me just play that back for you real quick. So you can To me, that almost sounds like a jet engine, right? And there's your backup tone. So the first one kind of sounds, like I said, like a jet engine. The second one just kind of sounds kind of close to a, a regular backup tone, but it's just a different frequency. Um, I was watching another video. It was a, it's a guy in a Kia. And I guess on the newer Kias, you can actually customize. You can have three different tones that it makes an engine noise. It's kind of like a futuristic Jetsons type sound. <laughs> or you can actually customize it as well. So you can customize what they're hearing. Uh, so that basically boils down to, at least on that Nissan system, is I got a couple speakers mounted to my underneath my bumper. And it's going to make that tone. And they, I guess they work with, uh, you know, some... Uh, blind folks and you know federation for the blind and what have you certain organizations uh to make it so it's a tone that's uh recognizable so they understand hey there's a vehicle coming i may may want to stay out of the way sort of thing uh, and like i said it's only under 30 kilometers an hour because they figure over that uh, the, the tire noise the road noise will take over for that at that point and then they'll be able to hear it going down the road at uh, so it's going to be there there's usually a uh uh, module in the vehicle somewhere. You're going to have a couple speakers on the outside. And then some, in some countries, it's able to be, you can override it and you can press a button. Uh, so it just kind of depends on where you are in the world. If it has the button, you can override it. If it doesn't have the button, you can't. So it's just some, some people want to be able to turn it off just because it's annoying or whatever. But uh, as far as the safety function, you know, it's, it's good to have just to make sure everybody's safe out there across the street and stuff. And that brings me to active motor mounts. Now, these have actually been around for quite some time, too, because I remember when they added, added this in the software, I think probably like 10 years ago, uh, for the very first ones, Toyota had some uh, that were vacuum operated on the vehicle. And then now they're common, pretty commonly electrically operated. So you can see it's a motor mount off a of Honda, and there is a plug right there. So I can actually check that for signal and uh, power and ground. It's used to reduce NVH. So NVH is noise vibration and harshness in the vehicle. So that's kind of like the engineering term or whatever uh, for vibrations. Honda uses it especially, and we're going to spend a little bit of time with the Honda one because of their cylinder deactivation system we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, with their cylinder deactivation system, when it goes down to three cylinders, you're going to probably have a lot of vibration on that. If only half the engine's working on a V6, it could vibrate. So it dampens those vibrations considerably. So on the older method that Toyota used, it had just a vacuum switching valve with a signal from the ECM. 
and then it would uh, send vacuum to the mount. And depending on how much vacuum was in there, it would uh, inflate, uh, basically inflate or deflate a bladder and just allow it to dampen the engine more or less, depending on uh, how, how much they wanted to do it. And then on the more modern systems, like on this Honda here, uh, it monitors crank signal, top dead center signal, which goes into PCM, also checks crank out, TDC out. And then it goes to the engine mount control module, which has its own module on the vehicle. And then it sends out a different, different varying current and moves a plunger up and down, depending on the amount of engine vibration. So we have rubber on the outside. It's like a regular rubber engine mount. And we, of course, have our, our bolts to mount in. And then we have some liquid in here. It's kind of like a thick gel. And then depending on how far this plunger presses the diaphragm, it either it makes it stiffer or it makes it looser. So it allows it to kind of soak up those vibrations. And the computer knows based on vehicle engine speed and so on, you know, what the conditions are, how much do I need to dampen this vehicle? And you can see there's also a cross section of the coil there. So it is electronically operated, it's an electronic action. All right, so there's just another picture of what that would look like on the outside. And we can see we got the mounts there and then the connector and then our coil assemblies down here. Also out there in the world uh, is going to be, this one's from Audi. So Audi has a, uh, looks like an electrically electromagnetic operated one, kind of looks like it looks like it uh, operates like a speaker in a way. Uh, so we have uh, coils and magnets. So we got permanent magnet on the outside and then we have a coil and depending on the magnetic field, it'll, it'll make it higher, make it lower and make it uh, go with the ups and downs of the engine there. So that is my overview. So now let's get a little bit deeper and we'll go on the tool. Most of the stuff that I'm gonna show you here, cause I get, I get questions and comments on this a lot. So most of the stuff I'm gonna show you here is gonna be able to be done on pretty much any snap-on scan tool with current software. Uh, people say, oh, well, you show it on a Zeus. Well, Zeus is nice and easy to get on the screen, but it'll work on an Apollo, a Triton, a Solus. As long as you have current software on the tool, you'll have the same capabilities as I'm going to be able to show it. By and large, because we are not going into guided component tests today. So we don't have guided component tests for those types of systems. They're the kind of weird off, off, the, off the wall type systems, right? So first one I want to do, since we just talked about the engine mounts, we'll go into the Honda Pilot. And we'll look a little bit deeper into the engine mount. So first place I want to go is I'm going to pop in a shop key here and take a little bit more detailed information as to how they operate, how much they are, a couple different things. So with the Zeus, since I have the vehicle loaded in here, it automatically loaded the vehicle. I didn't have to sign in. I didn't have to log the vehicle in. I'm just gonna do a quick search uh, for active engine mount, there we go. So active engine mount replaced right there and it's gonna give me all the information that I need in order to work on those active engines. First one I wanna look at is TSBs. And you can see rear engine mount chirps. So this is from uh, Honda. And apparently there was a problem with some of these mounts that they would uh, chirp. Symptom, you hear a chirping in the cabin with the engine running, the transmission and drive, and the engine at operating temperature. An issue with the rear engine mount can cause internal components to wear prematurely. So we could have a problem. I saw somebody comment up above uh, with uh, fluid leaks too. This may cause chirping once the engine warms up because it'll just kind of make a, make a jerky. Uh, do the diagnosis and based on results, replace the rear engine mount. So that gives you all the uh, parts, warranty claim, et cetera. Uh, let's see. So it says, uh, start the engine, make sure it warms up to operating temperature, put the transmission in drive and apply the parking brake, place a stethoscope or a long thin screwdriver on the airbag mounting bolt and listen for a chirp. So that's an interesting place to put it, but there. So I guess it's got to be close to the engine mount in that case. If you hear the chirp from the rear engine mount, go to step three. If you hear a chirp coming from a high pressure fuel pump, there's another bulletin for that. So there's, apparently there's a lot of chirps that these Hondas can make. Hear a chirp coming from the timing belt, go to this one. And if you do not hear a chirp, it does not apply. So then we go down, we remove a little heat shield, and we can remove the, uh, the mount. There's the rear engine mount right there. And it shows you the bolts, the repair procedure to replace it, replace with improved part, connect the connector, replace the undercover, and you're good to go. So apparently a chirp can cause that problem. And apparently other things on the vehicle 
in composite sure all right so we have different things like connectors and locations and operations so if we go into operation the active control mount system reduces the amount of engine vibration which is transmitted to the passenger compartment the ACM system consists of engine mount actuators, the engine mount control unit, and the PCM. PCM receives the engine vibration signal from the crank sensor and the cam sensor that sends the signal which is in phase with the predicted engine vibration to the engine mount control unit. And that way it'll cancel it out. The engine mount control unit sends current for driving the ACM actuator to the actuator, and it operates the plunger to reduce the amount of engine vibration. So there's the graphic we had there before from earlier on. Right, so if we wanted to go to say wiring diagrams, how am I gonna diagnose this? So if we go in here, it's gonna drop me off. First thing is that the first page is gonna be page two because that's where my active control engine mount control relay is. So it's gonna start there. So if I open that up, you can see the relay is right there. Now, if I go across the screen though, <clears throat> you're gonna find the mounts. So there's the mount right there. And you see the wires are pre-highlighted, so I can just do that. Zoom in there. So there's my engine mount control unit right there. So that's where the uh, power wires would go. And then I see my actuators right there. So then there's uh, like a ground right there under the dash. So let's see where that is. Let's see if that works for me today. No, of course not. All right. So we can see rear mount actuator, front mount actuator, and they're just actuated. Just so there's coils in there. It changes the amount of current going through the coil in order to get there. Okay, and then if I do this, and we can go into parts and labor as well, find out how expensive it is and how long it takes. So we go in here, the uh, active mounts are gonna be down here. So we got the front of engine compartment, rear of engine compartment, and we're 378 for one, 387 for the other, and that's from the manufacturer. You might be able to find aftermarket ones for less, uh, but that's how much it is from the manufacturer with the manufacturer part number right there. And then the front mount takes 2.8, the rear mount takes one hour, and then the side takes uh, 1.1. So there's your uh, labor operations, and there's your price there. Now, as far as what can we do with the scan tool with this, we got a little bit of background on it now. So what can I do with the scan tool? So I'm going to go back into my scanner. And it's going to load me into the vehicle, of course. And we can see all my different systems. So I got engine, transmission, et cetera. So if my active mounts, in this case, are going to be under steering and chassis. And then I have my active control mount right there. It's going to walk me into it. Simulation mode, yes. Okay, so we got codes, we got data, and we got freeze frame data, and we got functional tests. So functional tests, we can reset the system. We can do a test of the system. We can turn the front solenoid on or off, the front and rear solenoids on and off, or just the rear solenoid on. So if I wanted to turn them off to diagnose an engine problem, uh, I could do so by popping into this test and turning them off. So you can turn on and off the both front and rear side ACM solenoid while stopping the engine in the test. It is advantage to know the circuit status and solenoid valve for both sides solenoid. You can confirm the solenoid valve actuation with the sound. You can confirm the circuit condition visually while signal is displayed from the unit. We continue, we pop in there. Uh, make sure it's in neutral or park. Stop the engine, engine off. You can probably do it with a run it too, I bet. And clear any codes and then check the battery bolt. It may not, might not let you do it with the engine running. And of course, since it's in demo mode, it doesn't let me go any further. But uh, we'd be able to turn them on and off individually. It's just a, a uh, functional test, turn it on, turn it off. There's a test so we can test to make sure they're working and then reset them after. All right. Oh, and oh, let's look at the kind of data we can look at too. Why don't we do that? So we can have a look at data. So we have the control relay, the supply voltage, the current to the front and the rear, active engine cylinders, and so on. So we can see uh, uh, enough data where we could, uh, uh, that could be useful for us. All right, so that's active mounts. Let's go to uh, seat. So this BMW 5 Series has some seat stuff in it. 
This one has uh, some pretty advanced seats because it's a BMW. Got to have a fan. If I'm paying for a BMW, I better be paying to sit in a lap of luxury. Here, right? There's uh, it's got a lot of stuff in these seats. Also, I didn't mention this in the class either, but there are vehicles with um, massage seats now too. I know my buddy Jim who used to work here. He uh, he just took delivery of a Lincoln that uh, gives has massage seating. He was waiting till the massage seats were available because that's another thing too that's going on in the industry. I know I talked to a few people that uh, certain functions like heated or ventilated seats, things of that nature, aren't gonna show up in the cars because they don't have chips to deliver them. And if that's the only thing they're waiting for to deliver that car, then they're going to uh, just not do it, right? So let me try and activate that one again. It'll be a little weird on me. Simulator, there we go. My tool's being weird tonight. I may have to go in manually and do it now. All right, I guess that's what we're doing. So go into BMW US 2019. Here's where it's here's where it's stopping, right? Let me try to go in my might not get to show you that tonight. Work fine this morning. That's the thing with the simulator sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't like doing things. All right, I guess we're going to skip that one for now. Maybe we'll come back to it later. So we'll go to the Nissan Leaf and see the generator. The noise generator, the sound generator. So they call that vehicle sound for pedestrians is what uh, Nissan calls it. So we can go in here and that is a little bit further down here. Uh, vehicle sound for pedestrians right there. Codes, data, functional tests, right? So we have a functional test. We can go under special functions and we can actually use the factory tool. Uh, if you watch some of the videos on this system, it says you got to go into the factory tool to change the volume level. So we can actually go in here as VSP sound pressure level change is what they call it. And we can go in here and uh, this function is used to change the output sound level of the vehicle sound for pedestrian system. After adjusting the sound level, automatically be saved after exiting and we click continue to adjust it. So you can set it to the default, plus 1 dB, 2 dB, or 3 dB. Uh, I would think 3 dB would be the most noticeable out of anything because 1 dB is not a lot uh, of difference. But if you need it a little bit louder, maybe you live in a noisier area, maybe you want to turn it down to the default at the very minimum, you can do that too. Uh, and then as far as actuator tests for that, it's pretty much just going to be generating, uh, making sure the speaker works and then making sure the indicator light works. So between the two of those, uh, it's going to give you those indications. Next one we'll go to is this Jeep. So this has the active noise cancellation. So that has the in-cabin noise cancellation system. So let's see what we can do with the scanner on this guy. Okay, so we got to go through our security link session here and uh, unlock the vehicle for secure gateway, which shouldn't take more than a couple seconds here, even though we're in simulator, it still goes through the process. There we go, we're unlocked. All right, so it says we're available. Security link is nice and open and all vehicle manufacturer things can be done. Uh, so we were talking about, figure, oh, there it is, active noise cancellation. Notice how it's under the radio, right? Audio and video and infotainment. Active noise cancellation there. So codes, data, system tests, and miscellaneous functions. So system tests are going to give us a tone test. So it's going to output a tone. It's going to also have an output short test, a microphone tone test, and a microphone output short test. So it has... Uh, four different items that I can go through and I can actuate on the system. You'll just hear a burst of noise coming out of the speakers when you do. Uh, what do we got for data here?
battery voltage doors if, if the door is open it's probably going to work a little bit differently as well so just keep that in mind uh, if it's active for the active noise cancellation wants a crank signal whether it's enabled or disabled or not if any of the windows are open that's going to vary with the uh as far as whether it's, it's going to work or not so just be aware if you're going to test it you're going to want to have the windows up doors closed things like that uh just so the system works properly with that active noise cancellation all right and then one of the last things I'll do is we'll talk about Mercedes and their air scarf system. I thought this was crazy when I saw this on the list of modules on a vehicle. It's called the air scarf system. So what this does, it kind of works like the seat heater. And uh, when I have a convertible top, going to have a lot of wind there, and we are, we're going to blow air around our neck to keep us nice and warm. So it's an air scarf an air scarf kind of interesting and looks like i might not be showing you on that one but i'm going to go into shop key and show you on there talk about the air scarf pretty sure we got information on that. formatic Convertible an air scarf. Hey, there's my air scarf system right there. So it's under seats. Uh, let's see. So just a function. So there's my different modules that are with that, and then it's going to give me general function. So air scarf function allows the neck area of the driver or the front passenger to be ventilated with warm air at three heating levels. The warm air comes out an opening below the head restraint. The air scarf control unit activates the air scarf function depending on the following variables: select the heating level, outside temperature, vehicle speed, and soft top status. Uh, it's operated using the air scarf switch and the corresponding seat climate control switch group. And uh, that's how it's going to work. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but I just thought that was like, what will they think of next, right? So an air scarf for your for your neck, right? Air scarf for your neck. Crazy stuff. But hey, you know, if I'm paying that much money for a Mercedes, like I said, for a BMW, same thing. If I'm paying that much for that vehicle, I better be able to have a nice warm neck when I'm driving down the road, right? All right, so that's it for me tonight. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about next week. Hopefully you got a few little tips and tricks on those weird kind of esoteric different systems on the vehicles and how they work and you know, stuff that's out there. I didn't even know half the stuff that's out there until I started looking at, at some of these systems. So next week, we're going to do another component testing class as we have been doing before. And this one's going to be on diesel injectors. So we've already talked about gasoline injectors and uh, high pressured gasoline injector, direct injection. But now we're gonna go with diesel injectors. So there are some similarities on some of the newer styles anyways with the direct injection between diesel and gasoline. So we're just gonna talk about the differences, how we're gonna test them, how does it work and so on. So if you wanna join me again next week, same time, same place, six and nine Eastern. If you wanna join on Zoom, go to snapon.com slash OT and sign up there. Otherwise the six Eastern goes to YouTube like we're doing right now. So if you are watching on YouTube, Please make sure that you like and subscribe because a lot of people watching the videos aren't subscribed and we'd, uh, we'd like some more subscribers. Be, that would be pretty helpful. We'd be able to continue to offer this free training if we can do that. So it's youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics if you want to check it out there. The 9 p.m. Eastern class goes to my Facebook page. So if you uh, would rather use Facebook, so you can go to facebook.com slash snap on Jason, all one word, no dash and snap on to go find me over there. Give me a follow over. Also, if you want to see any of our past prior classes that we have available, they're all available on the YouTube channel as well. There's a playlist for live training. So things like ADAS, data bus testing, uh, the component testing series I referred to earlier, pressure transducers, et cetera. So a lot of, lot of content out there. This is episode 49 right here and episode 50 will be next week. So we'll hit 50 training classes. It's crazy to think about. We started this uh, back in the back in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, we started this to keep you guys informed. So uh, thanks for coming along for the ride and uh, we'll continue.
Next thing we'll do is Q&A, but before I do that, I do want to make sure I always mention my buddy Al. So Al also does free diagnostic training three nights a week. So he does Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Monday's on Apollo, Wednesday's on Zeus, and Thursday's on Train. So it's specific to the tool. The first hour for any of those classes is going to be, all right, let's make sure your Wi-Fi is working because we need a lot of things to, to operate through the Wi-Fi. Also, let's make sure that your... Um, you can set up your free Snapout Cloud account so you can share files with your customers. And then it'll walk through a whole a tool walkthrough using Fast Track Intelligent Diagnostics code to completion. And uh, just kind of walk through that for you and show you how it works. And hopefully it'll help you out. Uh, it's meant to have the tool in front of you, kind of follow along, watch him on the screen and, and uh, function through on your own tool. So that's the first hour. And that's the Apollo class. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, since Deuce and Triton also have scope and meter functions, he takes a five minute break after that hour, first hour, does another hour on scope and meter functions. So definitely a very thorough class. Al's been with us for well over 30 years and uh, he's, a, he's a wealth of Snap-on diagnostics knowledge. So definitely come check him out. Go to snapon.com slash OT. It is only on Zoom uh, just because it's kind of designed to be that smaller class. You can ask questions, things like that uh, with the class. Same time two five and eight central, six and nine Eastern. Snapon.com slash OT to check that out. All right, so let's look at questions. Looks like on Zoom, we are devoid of questions. That's okay. If you do have any questions on Zoom, just use the uh, Q&A button, type them in. I'm gonna go over to YouTube now. So on YouTube, they always start nice and early. So Ram50 V8, good day, welcome. Uh, Peter Arjun, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the comp comments. Uh, Quinn Hall is here, thank you for joining us. Mike's Automotive Diagnostics, welcome. Pat H, hello. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, Ram 50 V8 has a thermal imager that he likes. Uh, it's not a snap-on one, but that's okay. Uh, Nick's checking in from the UK. Welcome. Thank you for uh, always attending our training. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's see. Ram 50 V8 also says, something I've run into on active mouths that are oil-filled is misfires caused by fluid leakage. So yeah, the fluid leaks. And it can't adjust the vehicle just or the, the computer uh, assumes that it's misfiring, not that it's uh, can't adjust. Uh, let's see. And then Abel asked, uh, how, how is that motor? How expensive is that motor mount? So there's the uh, uh, it was about 400 bucks. We saw that. And then uh, Ram 50 is talking about the subscription process that's coming out on various things. So uh, I think I was talking about the seats at the time or something like that, because I know some manufacturers have gone to, well, if you want seat heated seats, it's going to be like nine bucks a month. So you turn it, they can turn it on remotely, turn it off remotely. And uh, depending on whether your subscription or not, the car has it, but you can't turn it on unless your subscription is paid up. So uh, it's an interesting, interesting idea. I don't know how much I go for that from the manufacturer, but, you know, nothing we can do about it. Uh, Nick asks, is it possible to put my Varus 19.4 in demo mode? No, actually, uh, it is a special software that we use just for training purposes. So we don't release that to the public. Uh, so really, it's just, it's just the trainers that have it. Let's see. Oh, goodness. Ram 50 V8 said he just had, he was talking about the diesel injectors as well. Um, just had to grab a call. 2010 GMC diesel customer went from eighth of eighth to a full tank full with gasoline and drove it 30 miles. So that's not going to be fun. That's not going to be fun. And then Nick says, can't wait for next week. So thanks a lot with that. Hopefully, we, I'm sure I will see you next week. We are always here. Always appreciate you guys coming out. We got a nice little community we got here now and everybody can kind of ask questions. Baja Joe, I, I think I mentioned that you're here, but if not, hello, thank you. Always always good comments from you as well. Uh, former or current Subaru Tech, I believe as, as well. So. Uh, thanks for joining everybody and thanks for saying hi and checking in. I always appreciate the comments and the questions. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this class. Uh, it's all the, those weird little things that make a car a little nicer to drive, but you don't necessarily need them to drive down the road. But hey, hey they do break and I may need to fix them at some point. So with that, uh, hopefully we'll see you next week for diesel injectors component testing class. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Take care.